selamat pagi Bapak Ibu sekalian. Perkenalkan saya Aji Setiawan, Aji. Di sini saya mewakili uh, tim Local Facilitators. Uh, ada Mas Cipu, ada Mas Haris, dan juga nanti ada Mbak Arum. Untuk uh, nanti kami masing-masing ada di kelas atau breakout room session 1234. Kemudian di sini uh, kami mendapat kesempatan untuk memaparkan pengenalan mengenai apa itu yang disebut dengan marginal abatement cost curve untuk memberikan konteks dari training hari ini. Jadi meskipun judulnya training hari ini adalah pengembangan MACC menggunakan software lib, tapi alangkah baiknya kita kenali dulu apa itu yang disebut dengan MACC dalam paparan singkat ini. Nah, di sini Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa lihat yang pertama adalah definisi dari marginal abatement cost curve itu sendiri. Jadi MACC itu merupakan sebuah tool untuk memperbandingkan efektivitas biaya dari upaya mitigasi emisi gas rumah kaca. Jadi efek untuk membandingkan antar opsi mitigasi mana yang lebih cost efektif. Nah, di sini yang dibandingkan adalah biaya marginal reduksi emisi, marginal cost of emission abatement dan juga potensi emisi yang dapat dicapai. Jadi itu ya, marginal abatement cost dan juga potensi emisi yang dapat dicapai. Nah, di sini Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa lihat sumbu X, sumbu X dari kurva MACC ini, kurva MAC ini adalah poten merepresentasikan potensi emisi yang dapat dicapai dari opsi-opsi mitigasi yang akan diterapkan atau yang akan dievaluasi. Nah, kemudian sedangkan sumbu Y adalah marginal abatement cost. Jadi, mohon untuk dicatat bahwasanya sumbu Y ini adalah uh, marginal abatement cost, bukan cost saja. Jadi, bukan cost biasa, bukan berapa US dollar, tapi selisih dari biaya mitigasi terhadap business as usual-nya, terhadap baseline-nya, per unit reduksi emisi. Jadi, ini adalah margin marginal cost, jadi selisih biaya per unit reduksi emisi seperti itu. Jadi sumbu X adalah potensi emisi yang dapat reduksi dari opsi mitigasi dan sumbu Y adalah marginal abatement cost yang mana selisih biaya per unit per ton uh, atau uh, per juta ton uh, per ton CO2 ekuivalen seperti itu. Nah, kemudian di sini Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa lihat uh, untuk sumbu Y di sini ada kurva ya Bapak Ibu sekalian masing-masing kurva atau balok atau batang ini merepresentasikan satu opsi mitigasi yang dievaluasi nah untuk opsi mitigasi yang berada di bawah sumbu Y sama dengan 0 ini artinya opsi mitigasi tersebut memberikan benefit atau net mitigation benefit apa artinya? jadi katakanlah di sini Bapak Ibu sekalian menerapkan PLT mini hidro Nah, ternyata PLT mini hidro nanti berada di sumbu negatif Y-nya. Nah, itu artinya adalah PLT mini hidro ini uh, di, relatif terhadap baseline-nya, baseline pembangkitnya misal pembangkit fosil, PLT diesel, PLTU, itu dia lebih uh, murah untuk um, reduksi emisi per unitnya. Jadi seperti itu. Benefit yang dimaksud di sini bukan kita mendapatkan keuntungan atau uang seperti itu, tapi di sini adalah relatif terhadap baseline-nya, opsi mitigasi itu memberikan benefit dalam reduksi emisi gas rumah kaca. Sebaliknya, untuk yang sumbu Y positif, ini adalah net mitigation cost, artinya pemerintah atau kita harus menanggung e, biaya mitigasi emisi GRK relatif terhadap baseline pembangkit yang ada atau yang digunakan sebagai baseline. Seperti itu. Nah, MACC ini secara keseluruhan uh, sangat cocok untuk mengevaluasi uh, opsi-opsi mitigasi dalam uh, penyusunan kebijakan uh, perubahan iklim karena MACC ini memberikan uh, kuantifikasi dari mana yang lebih efektif, uh, mana yang memerlukan biaya, dan mana yang memberikan benefit seperti itu. Nah, ini lanjutannya adalah uh, interpretasi dari uh, formulasi kebijakan berdasarkan hasil pengembangan MACC. Jadi Bapak Ibu sekalian, dari hasil-hasil uh, penelitian terkait MACC ini, memang pengembangan MACC tidak serta-merta atau tidak langsung dengan mudah atau secara direct 
diterjemahkan dalam uh, kebijakan. Namun, hasil dari pengembangan MACC ini memberikan indikasi-indikasi kepada pemerintah kira-kira opsi mitigasi ini membutuhkan support dalam bentuk apa sih, seperti itu. Nah, dalam sebuah uh, penelitian disebutkan bahwasanya dalam hal ini seringkali yang muncul sebagai uh, opsi ini adalah efisiensi energi seperti dalam bangunan, dalam industri. Nah, itu memerlukan command and control policies. Jadi pemerintah tidak perlu memberikan insentif, tapi pemerintah harus mem- memastikan bahwasanya kebijakan tersebut berjalan. Jadi ada mandatorinya seperti itu. Contohnya adalah energi efisiensi umumnya, tapi tidak selalu demikian. Kemudian untuk yang kedua, untuk yang positif, itu yang e, opsi-opsi mitigasi seperti pembangkit yang sudah komersial, itu sebagian masih memerlukan e, market-based policy atau incentive-based policy. Untuk di Indonesia, contohnya, misal dalam hal pengembangan e, pembangkit panas bumi, geothermal power plant, nah, Contohnya di sini pemerintah dapat memberikan uh, support dalam bentuk uh, government dealing, jadi risk sharing antara pengembang dan juga pemerintah. Atau yang lebih uh, progresif lagi, mungkin di luar negeri sana, di Eropa, diberlakukan yang namanya carbon tax ataupun carbon permit. Untuk carbon tax ini memang nanti uh, ditetapkan pajak karbon, berapa US dollar per ton uh, emisi yang uh, dihasilkan, Nah, itu untuk memenuhi target emisi tertentu. Sebaliknya, untuk carbon permit cap and trade, jadi setiap industri itu dibatasi, batasan emisinya berapa, ada carbon price. Berapa yang kedua, ada pun opsi-opsi yang masih terlihat sangat tinggi, itu mengindikasikan bahwa opsi tersebut masih memerlukan support dalam bentuk research, development, and deployment. Jadi contohnya adalah, nanti Bapak-Ibu sekalian bisa lihat tidal wave power plant, jadi pemakai listrik tenaga arus laut, itu MAC-nya masih tinggi, karena risikonya juga masih tinggi, capital cost-nya juga masih tinggi, jadi compare to baseline, dia masih mahal. Jadi masih membutuhkan uh, indikasi kebijakan berupa RDDND. Nah, MACC ini seperti yang tadi sudah disampaikan merupakan uh, tool perencanaan mitigasi yang apa rasional dan terukur. Contohnya untuk uh, mengevaluasi opsi-opsi mitigasi yang sudah direncanakan dalam pencapaian NDC kita Indonesia 29% dari business as usual 2030 ada atau kondisionalnya 41% dari business as usual. Dengan advantage sebagai berikut, yang pertama adalah memberikan insight uh, mengenai upaya mana atau teknologi mana yang perlu diprioritaskan. Kemudian tadi seperti slide sebelumnya, memberikan key information kepada pemerintah, memberikan indikasi mana sih opsi-opsi mitigasi yang memberikan benefit, mana yang memerlukan support dari pemerintah, insentif, dan sebagainya, dan juga mana yang memerlukan support dalam uh, bent- yang ketiga adalah mengkuantifikasi opsi mitigasi berdasarkan uh, kondisi di lapangan dalam hal ini salah satu keuntungan uh, model derived MACC dengan LIP contohnya adalah kita bisa mensimulasikan uh, sebaik mungkin seoptimal mungkin untuk merepresentasikan uh, kondisi jaringan seperti itu kemudian yang keempat adalah kurva MACC ini representasi atau ilustrasinya sangat sederhana, Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa melihat dalam satu kurva berapa potensi, uh, total potensi abatement atau reduksi emisi yang dapat dicapai dan berapa marginal abatement costnya seperti itu, nah perlu uh, saya sampaikan juga Bapak Ibu sekalian, di sini untuk MAC satuannya kan USD per ton CO2 ekivalen kemudian untuk abatement potensial dalam juta ton CO2 ekivalen, jadi Luasan satu area ini, misal dalam hal ini yang pertama adalah PLTS, yang kedua adalah PLTM. Jadi luasan satu area ini, kalau Bapak-Ibu sekalian mengalihkan nilai MAC dengan sumbu X-nya, nilai abatement potensialnya, Bapak-Ibu sekalian bisa mendapatkan biaya dari op, uh, opsi mitigasi PLTS. 
Kemudian sama juga yang kedua, Bapak Ibu sekalian kalikan MAC ini dengan abatement potensialnya, Bapak Ibu sekalian mendapatkan biaya karena USD per satuan emisi dikalikan satuan emisi, Bapak Ibu sekalian mendapatkan cost dalam US dollar. Nah, apabila hasil perkalian antara MAC dan abatement potensial ini Bapak Ibu jumlahkan, jadi dalam hal ini ini ada negatif sekian, negatif sekian, negatif sekian, kemudian dijumlahkan positif sekian, positif sekian, positif sekian, Bapak Ibu sekalian akan mendapatkan yang namanya total mitigation cost. Jadi total biaya untuk mengimplementasikan seluruh opsi mitigasi. Nah, ada juga yang disebut dengan uh, average MAC. Jadi ini marginal abatement cost untuk masing-masing opsi. Nah, Bapak Ibu sekalian kalau ingin secara total Bapak Ibu Bapak Ibu bisa bagi total biaya. Jadi tadi total biaya seluruh opsi mitigasi dengan total potensi uh, reduksi emisi GRK-nya, maka Bapak Ibu sekalian mendapatkan rata-rata marginal abatement cost. Jadi mungkin tadi ada di dalam soal pre-test, nanti pada saat post-test Bapak Ibu sekalian uh, kami harap sudah bisa menjawab. Kemudian yang kedua adalah metodologi dalam pengembangan MACC. Jadi dalam uh, beberapa waktu yang lalu kami mengerjakan sebuah studi MACC juga menggunakan LIP. Nah, ini adalah indikatif steps atau langkah-langkah yang kami gunakan dalam mengembangkan studi MACC. Yang pertama, Bapak Ibu baik di tingkat nasional maupun provinsi perlu melakukan identifikasi opsi mitigasi. Kenapa? Karena pada dasarnya studi MACC ini adalah studi assessment opsi-opsi mitigasi. Jadi listnya harus diidentifikasi terlebih dahulu. Bisa memang Bapak Ibu sekalian, misal yang dari perwakilan universitas, memang mau mendefinisikan 10 aksi mitigasi atau berapa aksi mitigasi untuk dievaluasi, atau e, Bapak Ibu dari provinsi bisa, oh dalam RAD GRK ada sekian aksi mitigasi, sekian proyek pembangkit, sekian proyek efisiensi energi, nah itu di daftar terlebih dahulu untuk didefinisikan. Kemudian, tidak lupa Bapak Ibu sekalian juga perlu e, melakukan FGD atau diskusi untuk mengakomodasi input dari stakeholders yang lain. Kemudian yang kedua adalah data collection and compilation, jadi kita kumpulkan data dan kita kompilasi, kita pilih, kita pilah. Nah, di sini Bapak-Ibu sekalian bisa melakukannya melalui desk study, stakeholders meeting, workshop, ataupun korespondensi dari penyedia data yang harus dikumpulkan datanya pada dasarnya adalah data teknoekonomi dari masing-masing opsi mitigasi, contohnya data teknoekonomi pembangkit atau data teknoekonomi dari penerapan efisiensi energi, seperti itu. Referensi data bisa diperoleh dari uh, data formal, data dari institusi, kemudian uh, laporan maupun publikasi. Kemudian yang ketiga adalah data assessment and evaluation. Nah, dalam studi yang sudah kami lakukan sebelumnya, kami lakukan assessment bersama stakeholders terkait untuk melihat apakah data-data capital cost, ONM cost, kemudian data efisiensi, data uh, apa availability dari pembangkit itu uh, layak untuk digunakan atau relevan. Dan itu harus disepakati Bapak-Ibu sekalian sesuai dengan konteks studi masing-masing. Nah, kemudian yang keempat, kita lakukan pengembangan skenario dan input data. Jadi, tadi Bapak-Ibu sekalian bisa uh, cermati bahwasanya MACC ini memerlukan setidaknya dua skenario, yang pertama adalah skenario baseline, jadi baseline-nya, misal baseline pada tahun yang diproyeksikan, nanti 2000, misal 2021 hingga 2030 itu tidak ada opsi mitigasi yang diterapkan, itu disebut skenario baseline. Kemudian Bapak-Ibu perlu mendefinisikan skenario mitigasi seperti PLTS, PLT biomasa, dan sebagainya. Baru dari situ kita inputkan datanya, data cost, data teknikalnya untuk nanti di-generate yang namanya atau dikembangkan yang namanya kurva MACC-nya. Nah, dalam LIP nanti skenario-skenario ini, jadi skenario mitigasi akan dibandingkan dengan baseline dan disimulasikan dan akan dihasilkan kurva MACC. Nanti kita akan kita akan pelajari bersama dengan Charlie Charlie dan juga dalam breakout sessions. Kemudian Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa lihat di sini 
apa sih yang dibutuhkan dalam pengembangan MACC? Ini adalah summary-nya. Yang pertama adalah list of mitigation plan. Jadi opsi mitigasinya terdefinisi dulu. Bisa dari dokumen-dokumen perencanaan yang sudah ada. Kemudian yang kedua adalah technical data. Contohnya apa sih? Contohnya adalah tipe teknologi untuk pembangkit, kapasitas pembangkit, kemudian availability-nya berapa persen, lifetime pembangkit, proses efisiensinya seperti apa, kemudian merit order atau dispatch rule ini juga apakah pembangkit itu diposisikan sebagai pembangkit base load, pembangkit dasar, atau pembangkit follower. Kemudian, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, karena ini konteksnya adalah reduksi emisi gas rumah kaca, jadi yang tidak kalah pentingnya adalah data faktor emisi. Seperti itu. Kemudian yang terakhir adalah data keekonomian, terdiri dari investment data, capital cost, kemudian operational and, operational and maintenance cost, fuel price, discount rate, dan sebagainya. Nah, ini yang terakhir Bapak-Ibu sekalian, mungkin ini overview singkat saja, bahwasanya LIP ini uh, sudah tersedia sejak dulu uh, Bapak-Ibu sekalian sudah familiar, beberapa sudah menggunakan juga bahwasanya ini adalah tool yang uh, kebijakan mitigasi perubahan iklim. Kemudian ini sudah digunakan di berbagai negara untuk uh, mengembangkan NDC dan juga uh, ini menjadi uh, andalan atau standar de facto dari beberapa negara untuk uh, mengembangkan uh, perencanaan mereka. Nah, informasi kunci dalam training pada hari ini adalah pada uh, Mei 2020 itu diluncurkan sebuah fitur baru dari LIP yang namanya Marginal Batman Cost Curve, jadi ada MACC Report. Nah, ini yang akan didemonstrasikan oleh Charlie nanti. Kemudian kita akan coba training atau exercise bersama dalam breakout session. Nah, ini, di sini mungkin uh, saya ingin sharing singkat saja bahwasanya dalam studi sebelumnya, sebelum fitur ini diluncurkan, mungkin Bapak-Ibu yang sudah familiar dengan LIP tahu yang namanya uh, Cost and Benefit Summary. Jadi, pada awalnya kami ingin mengembangkan atau memplot kurva itu secara manual di spreadsheet Excel dengan cara mengambil data dari cost and benefit summary. Nah, kemudian setelah fitur ini muncul, kami gunakan fitur ini, kami manfaatkan fitur ini. Nanti setelah ini kita coba pelajari perbedaannya. Nah, dalam pengembangan MACC sendiri, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, ada tiga pendekatan eh, dasar ya. Yang pertama adalah pendekatan parsial, kemudian yang kedua adalah pendekatan sistem retrospektif, dan yang ketiga adalah sistem terintegrasi. Nah, apa sih yang membedakan dari ketiga pendekatan ini? Yang pertama, untuk pendekatan parsial, setiap opsi mitigasi itu dibandingkan terhadap baseline atau teknologi referensinya, atau opsi referensinya. Contohnya, Bapak-Ibu sekalian punya baseline, katakanlah satu, satu jenis saja ya, PLTU seperti itu. Nah, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, bandingkan opsi PLTS itu terhadap PLTU, PLTM terhadap PLTU itu secara terpisah. Jadi kita tidak melihat apakah PLTS selanjutnya sudah diterapkan, kemudian kita akan terapkan berikutnya adalah PLTM, itu hubungan saling tergantungnya, interdependensinya itu tidak diperhitungkan dalam pendekatan ini. Jadi seringkali secara teoretis ini kurang memuaskan dan juga dapat e, menyebabkan e, misinterpretasi, tapi e, pada dasarnya e, metode ini juga e, digunakan, tetapi dengan batasannya yang tadi ya Bapak-Ibu sekalian, tetap bisa digunakan, tapi perbandingan terhadap baseline-nya itu dilakukan secara terpisah antar opsi. Nah yang kedua, pertama e, untuk sistem retrospektif ini, pertama, misal Bapak-Ibu sekalian punya 10 opsi mitigasi, Bapak-Ibu sekalian akan bandingkan terlebih dahulu seperti dengan metode parsial secara individu terhadap baseline. Nah, yang paling cost efektif itu akan diplot pertama. Nah, selanjutnya, sembilan opsi yang lain akan dihitung kembali, akan dipilih kembali, akan di-ranking kembali dibandingkan terhadap baseline, tapi dengan asumsi bahwa opsi yang paling cost efektif itu sudah diterapkan terlebih dahulu. Contohnya, Bapak-Ibu sekalian punya jaringan e, dengan pembangkit PLTU dan PLTD. 
Kemudian ternyata yang paling cost efektif adalah pembangkit listrik tenaga mini hidro. Nah, setelah mini hidro itu diplot, maka iterasi selanjutnya, 9 opsi mitigasi yang lain itu akan dibandingkan terhadap baseline di mana PLT mini hidro itu sudah diimplementasikan dalam jaringan. Seperti itu. Jadi itu kelebihannya. Kemudian yang ketiga adalah sistem terintegrasi. Ini lebih ke optimasi Bapak-Ibu sekalian. Jadi kita definisikan target pengurangan emisinya berapa. Kemudian model model ini akan menghitung sendiri mana-mana saja opsi yang dapat mencapai target tersebut dengan cost paling minimum atau least cost solution. Namun pendekatan ini memiliki kekurangan kita tidak bisa mengevaluasi masing-masing opsi. Opsi mitigasi kita tidak bisa lihat satu persatu karena sistemlah yang akan menentukan berdasarkan batasan atau boundaries yang kita tentukan. Nah, dalam LIP ini, pendekatan yang digunakan untuk menghasilkan uh, report MACC atau kurvanya nanti adalah pendekatan yang kedua, yaitu sistem retrospektif. Jadi yang pertama, yang paling cost efektif diplot terlebih dahulu, yang relatif terhadap baseline cost paling cost efektif diplot terlebih dahulu. Kemudian yang kedua, sembilan op, misal ada 10 opsi, 9 opsi lainnya di run lagi dengan asumsi opsi yang tadi yang paling cost efektif sudah diimplementasikan. Kemudian terpilih opsi kedua, di run lagi 8 sisanya dengan asumsi 1 dan 2 tadi sudah diimplementasikan dan seterusnya. Nah, yang terakhir Bapak Ibu sekalian, kami ingin menekankan bahwasanya pengembangan skenario ini memerlukan minimal dua uh, skenario yang pertama adalah baseline baseline skenario ya ini adalah skenario tanpa opsi tanpa implementasi mitigasi pada tahun perencanaan kemudian nanti untuk uh, skenario mitigasinya Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa definisikan masing-masing PLT biomasa, PLT panas bumi dan sebagainya. Mungkin uh, demikian pengantar dari kami tim fasilitator Selanjutnya kami kembalikan ke Mbak Alvi selaku moderator. Terima kasih Mbak Alvi. Um, so just just a couple of slides, but then I will just show you how some of this works in practice within Leap because I think Aji has already covered a lot of the theory. Um, so let's get started. So I'm not even going to bother with this slide because I think Aji's covered this about basically what a Mac curve is um, and how how it's laid out. Um, he's also gone through in great detail these three different approaches, this partial approach, the retrospective approach, and the integrated approach. But let me just uh, say a little bit more about this, and there's some breaking news as well. Um, so the partial approach is this uh, first approach, which um, basically evaluates options relative to a baseline technology, but doesn't look at any of the interactions between those options. So it it, do, it does have one big advantage in that it's very fast uh, because you don't have to do a lot of calculations, but it's certainly less thorough than doing um, a retrospective approach. And so it can lead to misinterpretations, but it can also be quite useful as a very sort of quick technique for when you're sort of debugging your model and you just want to get a very quick sense of which options are the cheapest. So that's the partial approach. Then the retrospective approach, again, is this option where you you first look at all of the measures that you're thinking about relative to the baseline and you find which one's the cheapest and you plot that one first. Then you take all of the other measures and then you recalculate them, assuming that you're now implementing the cheapest option. So every time you sort of take a step up the MAC curve, you recalculate all of the remaining options and then each time you plot the next cheapest one. So the, the retrospective approach has this big advantage that it's able to capture the um, impact of the prior cheaper options on the later options. So it can tell you sort of if, if implementing an earlier option is going to have an effect on the mitigation potential or the cost of the later options. So it's definitely superior to the partial approach, but, uh, but as you can imagine, it requires much more effort to calculate because you have to recalculate the scenarios. You have to do multiple passes through the calculation to recalculate the scenarios. 
And the exercise we're going to do today will be using the retrospective approach. And you'll see for this example we give you, it doesn't take so long, so it's not too bad. But if you were doing, um, you know, a kind of a real world option where you had, you know, I've seen countries where they've got like a hundred options they're trying to plot on their map curve. That could take a very long time to plot. So, you, you know, there, there may be some advantages also just uh, looking at the partial approach. And then finally, I think Adji, Adji also mentioned the integrated approach. That's in, in LEAP, we do integrated modeling anyway. So if any of you who have used LEAP will know about integrated modeling, but typically we don't use that to plot a map curve. So typically in LEAP, we're looking at all of these options combined together and that does capture all the interactive effects of, the, of, of those options. So it does, a, it does a better job than either the partial or the retrospective approach of giving you the true costs and the true mitigation potential. But typically we don't plot that on a map curve in LEAP. Um, so those are the three approaches. And then kind of the, the, uh, sort of the breaking news, and this is as of this morning, <laughs> so this is kind of really, really breaking news, is uh, that up until this morning, we only supported the retrospective approach. But we're about to release a new version of Leap. And in fact, I only just finished it this morning. So I'll be releasing it later this week that actually allows you to do a partial approach as well. So it allows you to do this sort of uh, much quicker, faster, but not quite as satisfactory approach as well. So look for that uh, in an update coming later this week. And, and I would also mention this book, unfortunately it's not as easily available as it used to be. This, this book used to be available for free, but I can't find this anymore. But there's this book called Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Assessment, a guidebook that was was written a long time ago, back in 1995. Um, but that's a very good guide. It gives very good sort of introduction to all these different methods and goes through the pros and cons of some of these methods. And a lot of what's built into LEAP is really based on the sort of the theory that was developed in some of those earlier papers like this book here, this Satay and Myers 1995 book. Um, so just that's just some of the theory, um, just to uh, repeat some of the things that Adji was saying earlier. But just a couple of words of caution as well about how, when and how to interpret Max. So as Adji said, Max, Max are very useful for helping you uh, get a sense of which are the most cost effective uh, options and how much abatement you're going to get from each particular option. Um, so they're very good for sort of prioritizing implementation of options. And, you know, traditionally in climate policy, you know, it just seems like common sense that you should always do the cheapest options first. You know, we often hear this expression that we should look for the low hanging fruit. And, you know, of course, it makes sense to do the cheapest ones first and only to do the more expensive ones later on. And that's very much the thinking that's embodied in a Mac. You know, the Mac is showing you, you know, the options on the left, they're the cheapest ones. So probably you should do those first. Right. The whole idea is to help you prioritize the options. But there are sometimes, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense to do that. Uh, and it may seem counterintuitive, but sometimes it does make sense to invest in options, even if they are more expensive. Um, and I guess there's a few cases. Uh, so particularly if investing in the higher cost options now can help to drive down the cost, um, you know, because by investing in it now, we're helping to drive down the cost for greater implementation later on. So certainly solar power might be an example of that, as might be wind power. Um, but also not just cost, you know, if, if we need to experiment with some things now because we know we're going to need those technologies later on, that might be another reason to implement those things now, even if they don't seem like the cheapest now. And maybe a good example of that is electric vehicles. Um, so particularly in countries that have very fossil dominated electricity supply, which certainly Indonesia does, um, electric vehicles may not appear to be very cost effective. Well, they may not be very cost effective now as uh, CO2 mitigation options, but it may still make sense to prior prioritize them, even if they don't look great on a map curve both to drive down the, you know, you're helping to drive down the battery costs because you're helping to drive learning in the vehicles by investing in them. But that's kind of a global issue that might not, you know, what happens in Indonesia might not make a huge difference to the global price of uh, lithium batteries. 
but you know even within one country it may make sense to look at those options because you know you need to start sort of doing the societal learning that's required now for example you know how are we going to implement the electric vehicle charging infrastructure that we need for later on if we're going to have lots of electric vehicles so and i think it's certainly true that um you know evs are going to be a very a, a necessary ingredient in achieving really ambitious climate mitigation goals so we kind of need to experiment with them now so that once we have a cleaner electric supply system we can do those two options together to really get towards our you know target co2 reductions and i think the other thing that's worth mentioning is that max you know by definition they're plotting one thing against another right they're plotting economic costs against greenhouse gas abatement and those are not the only issues that you care about in, in, in most countries. You know, for example, in many Southeast Asian countries, air pollution might be more pressing concern than climate mitigation. And the options that look most cost effective in terms of climate mitigation are almost certainly not the same as the options that look most cost effective for uh, air pollution abatement. Sometimes there are win-win, you know, some options look good on both metrics. So just be careful, you know, the, the MAC is only one way of looking at your options. It's not a definitive reading on what's the best thing societally. It's just one way of helping to prioritize things. And I should mention that one of the ways that you can take into account some of these additional options is by looking at externality costs. So, you know, you can look at the externality, the air pollution externalities associated with climate change mitigation. And it's possible to do that in LEAP actually, to include some of those externality costs in the overall economic costs that you're looking at. Okay, enough theory. Um, let me go through some of the basic steps. I've just got four slides here. It's quite simple to set up Max in Leap. So Max first appeared in the 2020 version of Leap. So I hope you've all got uh, the most recent version of Leap, which I think is 2020.1.18. I hope you've all got, got that installed on your computers by now and you've got it, got the uh, registration codes entered because you're going to need a version like that to do these exercises. But there's basically four steps to setting up Max in Leap. So the first step, and this is kind of a big step, the first step is that you need to have a more or less complete Leap model, or as we call it, an area in Leap. So that needs to have a baseline scenario, and it needs to have multiple individual mitigation measures, each of which is implemented as a scenario. Um, so those each of those measures is like a sort of mini scenario that can be considered independently or combined into an integrated scenario. But typically you want to think about each of those options, how are they gonna compare against the baseline and or how are they gonna compare against some other combination of scenarios. Uh, so for each of those scenarios, each model should fully quantify both the emissions reductions and the cost of implementing each measure. So that's kind of input data into Leap. You know, for example, if you've got like an efficient lighting scenario, you need to say, you know, what's the relative efficiency of old light bulbs versus new light bulbs, or and what's the sort of the difference in costs of, you know, old lighting and new lighting. Um, and I think the the exercise we're doing later on will take you through some of those examples and give you some of the input data you need in order to build some of those scenarios. So that's step one is just sort of creating a model that has these individual measures in it. The second step is that you'll go to the scenarios screen in Leap and I'll show you this in Leap in a minute. So don't feel you need to look at this right away, but I'm just gonna take you quickly through the steps and then I'll show it to you in Leap. So in the scenario screen, what you're gonna to need to do is mark each of those individual uh, measures scenarios. You need to sort of tell Leap that you want those to be considered in your MAC curve. So you can see this example here, I've got a list of different measures and I've put a check mark over here, the thing I've circled in red uh, saying include in MAC reports. So you do want to include all of the individual measures. So I want to include, in this case, I'm looking at Fredonia, the sample data set. So here I want to look at my lighting scenario, my efficient refrigerator scenario, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't want to include the baseline or the mitigation scenario. So the baseline is sort of the counterfactual scenario. That's not one of the measures. And then the mitigation scenario 
is like a combination of many different scenarios. So it's a sort of an overall strategy that's created by combining different scenarios. So you don't want to compare that one because that's already contains the scenarios that you're interested in. So that's kind of really sort of the difference between the sort of the integrated analysis that you do in the most, most of the rest of LEAP and the MAC curve analysis that we're going to do in this particular exercise. So it's sort of two different ways of thinking about mitigation. So yes, yeah, so don't include the baseline scenario or any scenarios that combine measures like an overall mitigation scenario. So in step three, then you're going to go and generate the MAC curve itself. So the first thing you're going to do is go to the summaries view in LEAP. You're going to click on the manage summaries screen and then you'll need to create a new uh, MAC type report. So you can actually have multiple MAC reports, but I think in this exercise, we're just gonna create the one. I think in this exercise, it may already have been created for you, but the, uh, your instructors will take you through some of the details. But in principle, if you haven't already got a MAC report, you need to go and create one. So you go to the summaries view, you click on a button that says manage summaries, and then over here on the right, you'll create a summary. You give it a name, call it the, call it the, the MAC report, whatever you want to call it. And then what you'll do is go to a second screen where you, spec you, you enter the sort of uh, the setup of the MAC uh, report. So you'll enter various information. For example, you'll say, what is the scenario that they're all being compared against? So typically there you'll, you'll select a baseline scenario. You know, that's the scenario against which all the other measures are gonna be compared against. Then you'll set up the two variables, the variable for the Y axis and the variable for the X axis on the MAC. So in this particular example, I'm looking at the, not CO2 emissions, but I'm looking at overall global warming potential. So I'm combining my CO2, methane and nitrous oxide into one indicator. That's my global warming potential. So it's like CO2 equivalent. Um, and here you, here you can set that up as the abatement variable. And then you're also gonna set up the cost variable. And typically that will be the, the, uh, the overall social cost benefit uh, variable calculated in LEAP and you want to look at the results right at the top of the tree in LEAP. So you want to look at the overall costs for the, for, for the, whole, um, uh, for the whole model. The same with the, the emissions and the cost. You want to make sure you're looking at the costs for the whole system, you know, not just for one particular sector. Although you could actually do MAC curves for one particular sector, but in this particular example, we're just going to, we're going to do the uh, MAC curve for the area as a whole, for the whole uh, for the whole model. Uh, let's see what else to tell you. Um, okay, so yeah, so one thing I did want to mention is you don't have to look at, you know, it's not necessarily, it's not necessary to use MAC curves to look at um, CO2 or global warming potential. You could look at a MAC curve for air pollution, for example. You could look at PM 2.5 and how much each option costs to reduce that. So that's an option. Does someone want to come in? the voice no okay um, and then finally let me just mention one other thing down here so this is like a brand new feature in the new version of leap you don't even have this version yet but i'm going to show it to you in a minute just to give you a sort of a uh, a sneak peek of it this will be coming later this week so you can in this new version of leap the dot 19 the one after the one you've got you'll be able to select whether you do a partial a fast partial analysis or a more thorough but slower retrospective analysis. So I'll show you how those two work and how you get slightly different results from each one. Okay. So once you've done that, once you, once you set up the Mac summary report, you just come back to the summaries review and you need to click on this refresh Mac button and that will start the calculation process. And at that point it will go through and calculate each of the, uh, each of the little, um, each of the points on the Mac curve. So each point, more or less corresponds to a measure. So, you know, the in the first pass, it will go, it will calculate, first thing you'll do is it'll calculate the baseline scenario, then it will calculate all of the other scenarios, and then it will sort them to find out which one is the most cost effective one. And that's the one it plots first. So that will be this point on the left of the curve. And typically, you know, that, that might be a negative number. So that first option might actually have benefits compared to the baseline scenario. I mean, it all depends on the options you're looking at. 
So then, then it'll do a second pass of the calculations. It'll take all the remaining ones, so all of the options except for the one it just implemented, and it will recalculate all those scenarios. Because each of those scenarios may be affected by implementing the first measure. You know, if the first measure is, is something that maybe is a clean electricity supply measure, then once you've implemented it, then, you know, if the later measures are energy efficiency measures, they won't be as cost effective as they would be against the baseline because the supply is already cleaner. So you have to think about that sort of interaction, interaction between the measures. And that's kind of the big benefit of doing this retrospective analysis. Each measure is affected by the implementation of the previous ones. That's why it's called retrospective. And it will basically keep doing that. So each time it will calculate all the remaining scenarios, find the cheapest one and plot it, then remove that one and then calculate all the remaining scenarios. So if you've got 10 scenarios, you know, the first pass will do 10, 10, calcula 10 scenario calculations, the next pass does nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, until it's calculated all of them. And it's at that point, it can then plot the map curve. Um, but then there is this new option, which I will show you in a second, which is just called uh, the partial analysis. And all that does is it does one pass through and it just says, what do each of those, those options look like relative to the baseline? And then it just plots the results. It doesn't, it doesn't look at any of the interactions. So it's not as satisfactory, but it's super quick. <laughs> okay. And then finally, this is sort of the way that Leap will show you the results. It'll show you a chart that looks like a standard Mac curve, you know, like one of these here. Or, or it'll show you a table format, and we, we can look at the table later on. But typically, it's going to show you the total abatement and the total cost of e each option relative to a baseline. So typically, the abatement numbers should all be positive. Uh, the costs probably will start out negative, but then will become positive. Um, um, then it will show you... Um, just the cumulative values, the cumulative abatement and the cumulative cost, and then it will show you the unit cost of each one. So the sort of the, the marginal cost of implementing each measure once you've, you know, assuming you've implemented all the previous measures. And then it finally shows you just sort of the average cost, which is basically sort of the average height of all the bars um, uh, aggregated across both the negative ones and the positive ones. And I think one thing, Adji, I think he mentioned this, but maybe it's just worth quickly reminding you, a really nice property of a map curve is that the, um, the, t the area under the curve of the Mac is the sort of total amount you're spending. So in this one, you can see the, you know, the area below the x-axis is very large and the area above the, the x-axis is very small. So you see the net cost of this is actually negative and you can see that's plotted here. So the, the average cost is a, is a negative cost across all of those different options. Okay, so that's the slides. Let me just show you that very quickly in Leap. How long have I got? Altami, how am I doing time-wise? Have we got another five minutes? But tell me you still have about 15 minutes. 15, okay, I won't need that long. So I'll try and do it in five minutes. Okay, so let me just okay. take you through those steps just in this very, here I'm just looking at Fredonia, um, which I think you all will have on your data, on, on your uh, installed versions of Leap anyway. You can see I'm using a slightly different version from what you have. I have the, the dot 19 version, but I promise that's coming later on this week. So to set up the Mac curves, let me just take you through those steps again. So the first thing you need to have done is create your mitigation measures and your scenarios and your instructors today will take you through some of that process. So I won't go into that in a lot of detail now. But if we look at the scenarios button up here, this shows us all the scenarios we've created. And here I'm just showing the Fredonia data set. So here you can see I've got a baseline scenario I've got a mitigation scenario, but the mitigation scenario is just a combination of all of these individual measures down here. So one of the nice things in Leap is one of the ways you can create scenarios is you can do them individually or you can plug them together to make a sort of package of scenarios. So here our mitigation scenario is sort of a package of all these individual measures. So I don't want to include either of those two in the Mac. So the baseline is the one I'm gonna compare against anyway, but the mitigation scenario is already an integrated 
combination of measures. So I'm not going to include that in the MAC, but then all these other ones you can see I am including them in the MAC report. So you just need to do that as a first step. Once you've done that, you can go to the summaries view in Leap. And here I've already got one, but let me pretend I was making a new one. So here I'm in the summaries review. You can see here's all the summaries I've already got. There's various different ones. There's cost benefits summaries. There's a decomposition report, which is another special kind of report. Then I've already got two Macs. But I could go to the, the manage summaries screen and I could add a new report. So if I want to do that, so when I, I did that too fast then, didn't I? So in the cost benefit, in, in the, the summaries view, you can click on the manage summaries screen that pulls up this screen here. And then you can add a new kind of summary report. So you could call this my Mac report. And then you have to choose the type. So here it's already says Mac, but there's three different types. But in this case, we're gonna be creating Mac uh, marginal abatement cost curve reports. And when we hit okay, it takes us to a little setup screen where we can specify the, the characteristics of this my Mac report. So here it's the first thing it asks you is, you know, what scenario do you want to compare against? So you, typically you want to compare against your baseline scenario. The second option is it asks you what is the variable that you're going to plot on the uh, on the y-axis. <laughs> I have to think about that then. So the y-axis will be the, um, will the will be the abatement. So there we want to plot the emissions variable. So here, if we click on this dot, dot, dot button over here, or if we double click this, we can choose the variable. So we always want, in this case, we're going to pick the top level branch in the leak tree because we want to look at the emissions for the whole country, you know, for the whole of, in this case, Fredonia, or it might be Indonesia. Then we're going to click next. Then we're going to pick the variable. So we could do, in this case, I'm, we could do all global warming potentials. So that combines CO2 with methane and other gases. Or we could look at a particular one. You know, I could choose in, uh, pollutant loadings. Then we're going to set the unit. In this case, millions. If we're doing pollutant loadings, I'd need to say it was a particular effect. So in this case, I might want to say I want to look at uh, particulates maybe, or where is that, PM 2.5. I can't seem to find that. Uh, maybe this particular model doesn't have it, but I could do nitri nitrous oxide or sulfur dioxide or whatever. So whatever pollutants are being calculated, I could choose those. And then when I hit finish, that's set it up there. So you, I, I typically when you're doing CO2, you probably want to do millions of tons rather than tons. So you can see in this particular one, I did millions of tons. So you can you can choose both the scale and the unit. And then there's this filter here that you can use if you want to, but I don't think you'll need to do that if you're doing um, uh, global warming potential. So if you're doing global warming potential, you could just do this one here, 100 year GWP, maybe just set it to million metric tons and you're done. And then the second thing you want to plot is what goes on the um, y axis, the cost. So here we're going to pick this variable here, social costs. It's already by default, it's already the right variable, but we could adjust that maybe. Maybe we want to do it in millions of dollars rather than dollars. And of course, if it was a, you know, if you were doing in another country, you don't have to use dollars, you can use whatever currency unit you've set up for your study. So it doesn't have to be dollars, you know, it could be euros, it could be um, um, the currency in Indonesia as well. He says not remembering what the currency is in Indonesia, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, and then there's a couple more options. So one is you can, you can optionally, set, optionally say I only want to include costs for a certain number of years. So you don't have to go all the way to the end year, you could only go to maybe 2030. Maybe if your model goes to 2050, but you only want to look at the MAC curve for 2030, you can do that. Um, but in this case, we don't need to do that. You can also adjust the discount rate. If you leave both of those unchecked, it will just use the, the model end year and it will use the default discount rate that you've already set up for your model. And then the last option, you don't have this option. This is coming, this is a new option that's coming in the next version of Leap. But here you can choose either to do a retrospective analysis or to do a partial analysis. 
So the retrospective one is slower, but more accurate. And the partial one is faster, but not as accurate or not as thorough, I guess I'd say. It doesn't capture all the interactions. So each of them will give a different result. So bear that in mind. Okay. So once you've done that, you've created your report. You can see it's one of a different named reports you've got there. Um, let's select one now. So here's one I already made my, here's a, a Mac curve. But if I conclude the one called my Mac report, you can see that doesn't have a curve yet. It hasn't been calculated. So one of the things, the first thing you'll have to do is use this refresh Mac button. You know, once you've set it up, use the refresh Mac button and that will set off a calculation. So let me explain what's going on in the calculation while it's doing that. So you can see it's doing multiple passes. It's doing six different passes. So in the first pass, it calculates all the scenarios and it says which one's the cheapest. Uh, and then it basically keeps that one to one side and it calculates the cost and the abatement for that one option. Then in the second pass, it does the re remaining five options and it works out which of those is cheapest and then it reserves that one and it keeps doing that. So in each pass, it does one fewer scenario until it's done, you know, it's gone through all of them and there's only one scenario left. And at that point, it can then um, plot the chart, which I think it's just about ready to do now. And there you go. And then now it's plotted the chart. So you can see it plots it either as a table or as a chart. So that's basically Mac curves in Leap. But again, I just wanted to show you this, this new feature that's coming later this week, <laughs> which is show, which does either a partial or a retrospective analysis. And it's kind of interesting because they do give different results. So here's a retrospective one. And you can see it calculates that the total abatement is about 500 million tons. And you know, the most expensive option goes up to about $700 per ton. But if we, look at, uh, if we look at the same options, but in terms of a partial analysis, so remember that's 500 going up to 700. If we look at a partial analysis, it's similar, but it's not exactly the same numbers. Um, maybe it's better to look at it as a table actually. So again, let's look at the first option you can see is lighting and that has an average cost of minus $17 per ton. So that means it's a benefit of $17 per ton of, of CO2. And if we look at the respective, retrospective, it's minus 17. If we look at the partial, it's exactly the same number, right? Because the very first option is the first one you're doing, it's the baseline. So they, they will be the same regardless of the measure. But then the second option and the third option might be slightly different. So here, the part, so we have minus 17, minus three, minus two. But if we look at the retrospective, you can see there's slightly different numbers. That's because those options are now, they don't realize that you've already implemented these other options and there may be interactions between them. So it's better to do the re retrospective, but it's slower. But nevertheless, it can still be useful to have the partial option as a sort of quick prototyping approach. You know, if you just want a quick read to get a rough sense of things, if you want to play around with things interactively in the model, then I would think it's okay to use the partial analysis. But, but I would say if you're writing a final report, you should always use the retrospective.